Everyone loves the holidays. The decorative lights go up, the bell ringers jingle outside the stores, and the cheerful music hits the radio a little earlier than the year before. The holiday season lifts the spirits of everyone around. The colorful pines, fake and real, are erected in living rooms. Ornaments hanging from every branch with the shining star placed at the pinnacle. Carols are sung and gifts are bought, each wrapped in prints of reindeer and candy canes. Aside from the annual stress, everyone gets a little lift from the Christmas spirit. And just for a while, everything doesn't seem so bad. That is, for everyone except me. I hate the winter. And more than that, I hate Christmas. Not in the sense of Ebenezer Scrooge or the mischievous Grinch. The disdain is imprinted in my mind. And no matter how hard I try to repress the memories, they resurface from the moment the jolly tunes can be heard. From my window, I watch the serenity of the first snowfall. That magical canvas of white, drawing kids into the cold so they can throw snowballs or make angels. I watch them frolic in their little wonderland, laughing and giggling as they stick out their tongues to catch a dancing flake. So much happiness. And yet the only thing I see is his face. The plopping of white rocks. The creaking of broken branches. The clacking of fake teeth. When I watch them pack the snow, I get sick to my stomach. I dry heave in the toilet until the nausea passes and my hands stop shaking. Years of therapy. Medications. Drinking. No matter how hard I try, I can't escape the horror of my past. Just when the walls start to repair, he's there. I close my eyes, but he haunts my dreams. Each time I start to drift away, the grip of branched hands pulls me back. I'm not allowed to move on. I'm not allowed to forget Braxton. This story happened a long time ago. Twenty years ago, to be exact. Sometimes I think it was just a bad dream. That it never really happened. Growing up, I blacked out the memories, drifting around like a shell. As I grew up, however, the memories returned. Slowly at first. The winter wind. A broken branch. A pair of dentures. For a while, I questioned whether it even happened or not. But when I go and look at the police reports, I am brutally reminded that it is forever etched in history. The tragedy of Cypress Glen, that shook the small apartment complex in the early 2000s, has long since been forgotten. As all the families impacted have moved away, or in some cases were incapable of moving on. Nobody speaks of it. Not even a little. But as I watch the first snow behind the fogging windows, I find myself adding something stronger to my hot chocolate as the candy cane shovels unearth the memory once more. It happened in December 2001. I was eight years old. The winter seasons were much harsher then, in the days when lake effect snow meant literally burying the town in several feet every time a storm hit. I was eagerly awaiting Christmas, my busy little mind full of thoughts of presents and the jolly old man, we were on the first week of winter break when the snow hit, and it showered relentlessly until it was drifting halfway up the patio doors. With so much white everywhere, it was just like the movies. Watching it come down in the warm living room through the glow of festive lights. My mom was a bartender at a bar at the edge of town. My dad was a marine, and currently deployed. I didn't understand the significance of these things. I just remember wanting him to be home for Christmas, and not knowing why he wasn't. My mom worked a late shift at the end of the night, so she would leave me home alone for a few hours while she made cocktails, until after I fell asleep. This was back when you could do something like that. I was a brave little kid, and it wasn't my first time hanging out in a blanket fort by the Christmas tree hearing the same iconic lines from Rudolph and Frosty on the television. 
With fits of excitement, I watched the accumulation outside, knowing full well I would be begging my mom to go play in it as soon as I got up. The next morning, I opened the blinds to find nearly a foot and a half, and the neighbor's kids trouncing about. With squeals of delight, I jumped on my mother's bed, waking her and begging her to let me out and play. After a few grumpy dismissals, she sighed and dug out my snowsuit and boots. They were wrinkled and beaten up from so much use and hours in the dryer, but they still fit. My gloves had been too worse for wear, so my mom made me do with several pairs of socks on each hand. I didn't care, as long as I could get out there before the other kids could hog all the snow. As she brewed coffee and started breakfast, I threw open the slider and dove head first, thrashing around to disturb as much of the untouched canvas as possible. Feeling the snow melt on my face, I sat up in my cold coffin, taking a moment to admire the scene around me. Heavy flakes were still coming down, deafening the air with its muffling static. It always felt so calming, the way it blocked out all the unnecessary noise. The sky was a gray and white marble. It was showing no signs of letting up. Ahead, the kids had noticed me and were starting to high knee over. There were five of them in total. The oldest was Robbie, who was ten. Tagging along with him was his little brother Christopher, who was messily taking a bite out of a snowball. He was four. Christopher would always gravitate toward his brother, and Robbie hated it. Behind them was Lucy. She was also six and was always easy to spot because she was mostly wearing pink. Even now, she trudged behind them, pink hat, pink gloves, pink boots. Coming up last were the twins, Preston and Presley. They were inseparable, always traveling like they were conjoined at the hip. They both had long hair, Presley's done in cute little pigtails. Their gloves, hats, and coats alternated colors. It was something their mother did on purpose. About time you made it out here, Robbie said. Christopher smiled, mouth full of snow. How long you been waiting? I asked. Only five minutes, Lucy said. The twins said nothing, but waved at me together. Behind us, a plow was hulking through the snow, lowering its blade with an awful grinding sound. We all stopped to watch it, the metal dragging across the parking lot as it pushed the snow into a gigantic mound in the corner. We watched the pile build slowly, all of us knowing we would soon be climbing all over it. Robbie turned around suddenly, a big grin on his face. He was always the one to come up with ideas. You guys want to build a snowman? We all exchanged looks. There was only one answer. While we waited for the plow to finish the lot, we started building it. Robbie was the first to get the ball rolling his bigger hands making for easier work. His would serve as the base. We'll make the head, the twins said together, and without a word they started packing a decent ball together. Lucy and I decided to make the body, and Christopher tried to jump in and help Robbie push it as it got bigger. He was mostly laughing and falling down, but Robbie didn't seem to mind. He would watch and smile at his little brother, but only when we weren't looking. He worked diligently, and it didn't take long with the four of us. We huffed and puffed with rosy cheeks, the cold meaning nothing in the excitement. It wasn't long until Robbie was done with the bottom. The big boulder rolled to a stop and wouldn't budge further. Robbie collapsed and sat next to it. Phew, I'm pooped, he said, taking deep breaths as he looked at the sky. Me and Lucy had just finished the body piece, her pink gloves and my socked hands smoothing it out. We lifted it together and placed it on the bottom, almost dropping it in the process. Christopher helped, giggling as he went. The twins came shortly after with a perfectly spherical ball they had packed together and placed it gently on top. It was an odd-looking snowman, but it was good enough. It was a little taller than Robbie and stood like a blank silhouette in front of my patio. Once it was done, we all sat and admired it. The snowplow drove away, leaving a freshly packed mountain of snow in its departure. We all caught our breath, large flakes hitting our faces. It's missing something, Lucy said. Duh, everything, Robbie said. We all looked around for something to decorate it with, but there was nothing but white everywhere you looked. 
There was no fancy carrot. No top hat. How about this? Robbie said, turning to us all. Tomorrow we all bring something from home to decorate him. Him? How do you know it's a he? I asked. It's too big to be a girl, said Lucy. Exactly, Robbie agreed. After a moment, we were all in agreement. Well, what do we name him? said Christopher. Together we sat in silence, looking up at the blank sculpted face of our winter friend. With no eyes or mouth, it reminded me of the mannequins you would see at the store. Just when it seemed there wasn't an answer, the twins spoke up. Braxton, they said, and we all exchanged looks. We knew the name all too well, and just hearing it made even Robbie bite his lip nervously. Braxton was the school bully, and a nasty one at that. He was much older than all of us. Our town was small, and our school consisted of one building with all the grades. It looked just like the shoe factory in Jumanji. Starting at kindergarten and ending with 12th, it housed all students that lived around us, since the closest town was too far away. Braxton was a middle schooler, and he loved to pick on little kids. Whether it was in the hall, on the playground, or outside of school, we had each had our run-ins with Braxton, and he didn't discriminate. He was awful to everyone. Are you sure? We could pick any other name, said Robbie. The twins just shrugged. It was hard to tell what the reason was behind anything they did. I didn't have any ideas, and when I looked at Lucy, she just shook her head. We can call him Cookie, shouted Christopher. Uh, Braxton it is, sighed Robbie. We agreed to come back to the snowman tomorrow and put on the finishing touches. We got up and played a while, climbing the large pile of snow the plow had made. We climbed it and jumped off, rolling to the bottom until we got too dizzy. The hill was so big the possibilities seemed endless. We burrowed a tunnel into the mound, big enough so one person could squeeze in at a time. When we were almost all the way through to the other side, my mom called me, telling me that it was time to have breakfast. I wasn't ready to go in, but the socks on my hands were soaked, and my fingers were starting to go numb. The other kids seemed to be tired as well, so we dispersed on the promise we would return the next day with our decorations for the snowman. We said our farewells, and I headed inside passing Braxton on my way to the patio. He just stood there quietly, his smoothed-out head making it impossible to tell which way it was really facing. I warmed up inside, ate some breakfast, and contemplated what I was going to contribute. My mom told me we were going to my grandmother's house for a couple days for the holiday, and tomorrow morning would be my last day to play outside until next week. I was bummed, but Grandma's house meant sweets and presents, so it wasn't all bad. I would just have to make the most of it tomorrow. That night, as my mom got me ready for bed, an idea popped into my head. My father was in the military, and he had all kinds of cool stuff that he brought home in his time away. He kept it all in a box in the closet. As my mother tucked me in and headed off for work, I pretended to fall asleep so she wouldn't think I was up to anything. I watched her go out the door and sneakily waited for her car to leave. Braxton stood in the dark outside silently, looking in all directions with his emotionless face. Even though it was nighttime, his stark appearance made him stand out. Once the coast was clear, I bolted into my parents' room and turned on the light, determined to find something in the closet. The box was at the bottom of the closet, covered in some junk and a hamper of old clothes. I quickly got the box out and opened it feasting my eyes on the exotic objects within. There were photos, little chains with tags on them, different sized bullet casings. Most of the stuff was cool, but none of it seemed right. That was until I saw the big red sticks. I picked one up and looked over it curiously, reading the side of it to myself. Fusey. Ten men. I didn't know what they were, and the words made no sense but there was only one thought in my head. It would be perfect for a nose. It would look weird, but it reminded me of my dad, so I decided it would be perfect. I packed everything up and put it back as I had found it, and ran back to the living room. I tucked the big red stick under the couch cushion, and hoped my mom wouldn't find it before it was time to go out and play. I spent the rest of the night watching cartoons, 
excited to go back out the next day. As my eyes grew heavy, I looked out through the slider and looked at Braxton. The snow had finally stopped, his round body standing in the calm night. I nuzzled into my covers and fell asleep, wondering what the other kids would bring. The next day I woke up bright and early, and immediately felt stricken by disaster. I looked to the slider to see Braxton where we left him, but he wasn't the same. He was shriveled and mangled, his head looking like it was about to fall off at any moment. The sight brought me to tears. I opened the glass door in a panic to feel it was warmer than the day before. The tracks we had left behind from rolling the snowballs were turned into grassy ruts, and the frivolous amount of snow we had the day before was now less than half. Everything looked wet and bogged down. I woke up my mother crying, and she tried to calm me after I showed her catastrophe. She assured me that it wasn't the end of the world, that there would be more snow and we could make another one. After some pouty back and forth, she suited me up so I could play once more. And when she went to go make coffee, I got the red stick from the couch and stuffed it into my coat. I ran out with puffy eyes, slipping in slush as I approached the withered snowman. I was first outside this time, and I decided to wait until the others came out before I did anything. The twins showed first, huddling next to each other like they always did. They saw the damage as they walked up, and their only emotion was a slight frown. Lucy was next, skipping on the shoveled sidewalk in a blur of pink. She stopped skipping when she noticed, and promptly started crying as I had earlier. She plopped next to me, where we waited in sadness until the last two showed. Robbie and Christopher ran a little late, the older brother pulling the younger behind. When Robbie saw its poor condition, he came running, practically dragging Christopher. No, 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 he cried in frustration. His face was red as he looked at it, his hands fumbling with something in his pockets. He asked what happened, but the weather was answer enough. We pouted for a while in defeat. Our snowman was ruined. Wait, we can fix him, he exclaimed, and we perked up at the thought. We've rolled him piece by piece, build him back up with more snow, he said. But all the snow is melting, and it's too windy, said Lucy, kicking her feet. I know, that's why we roll him into the woods. There's not as much sun there, and it's not as windy, he said, pointing to the trees that were in the distance, past the yards of the apartment complex. It was a steep incline to the trees, but we could see from here that there was plenty of snow in the clearings. We're not supposed to go in there. Our mother says so, the twins said. Nobody goes in there, I said. I know, I know, but it's either that or we lose them. We brought all our stuff, didn't we? He asked. We all nodded. I felt the red stick in my pocket. Robbie was right. We had to try and help him. Everyone was hesitant, but in the end we decided to do it. We would roll Braxton's pieces into the woods, where the snow would be less disturbed, and try to build him back to shape. I explained it was my last day to play for a while, and even though this saddened the kids, it made everyone get to it. We worked quickly and as a team. Each of us assigned pieces we would ferry to the woods. The twins took the head and cradled it like a golden egg. Lucy and I detached the middle portion and moved so Robbie could start rolling the bottom. Robbie struggled at first, but once he got to the hill, gravity took over. It bounded down the incline, packing more snow as it went. The rest of us rolled our pieces down too and picked them up at the bottom. Robbie and Christopher kept it rolling into the trees and over the untouched snow. It was tiring, but we kept going, cheering each other on as we went deeper into the woods. We started rolling the smaller pieces as well, packing the wet snow as they grew back to their former glory. I pushed and pushed with my sock-covered hands, looking over my shoulder every once in a while to see how far we were going. It went slowly at first, but the more we focused, the faster it went. Eventually, the bottom piece was too wet and heavy, and Robbie couldn't move it anymore. We halted on our pieces and helped him, all of us pushing together as a team. The big snowball continued to roll, picking up wet leaves and grass as we pushed onward. The ground got muddier and uneven and tall trees made it darker. I looked back at the apartment and could barely see it. We kept pushing. There was cracking and crunching under the massive ball, and we could see little twigs had been crushed under the weight. Some of them looked old, 
and they were covered in some kind of straw. We slipped on rocks, little gatherings of them that we couldn't see under the snow. We pushed until we couldn't push any more, and when we looked back, we couldn't see the building through the trees. Exhausted but driven, we doubled back for the other pieces. The wind picked up, hissing through the bare trees as we rolled the next one. We packed less so it would be smaller, but with the uneven ground it was difficult. Little feet stamped over the twisted sticks. Our feet kicked around the loose rocks. When we got to the end, it took all of us to lift the body and pack it into place. We carried the headpiece the rest of the way, the twins packing and fixing it as we went. The snow out there was dirty, sticky, and it caked our gloves as we finished it up. We passed it to Robbie, and he stood on his tippy toes and placed it on top. Finally, he was ready for his face. With him reconstructed, we all showed what we had brought. With cold, tired hands, we held out our items. Robbie and Christopher each brought a dark, smooth rock, ones they found on the beach over the summer. Preston and Presley brought their grandmother's old dentures, the jaws filled with worn artificial teeth. Lucy untied her pink scarf, and after some reluctance, held it out with a smile. I held out my red stick. We looked over each other's contributions, each just as unique as the last. Wow, said Robbie. It's gonna be an ugly snowman. We rounded up our belongings and handed them to Christopher, who we hoisted up to put them on. He stuck them all on softly, careful not to knock the head off. Two beach rocks for eyes, the big red stick for a nose, dentures for a mouth. Christopher wrapped the pink scarf around his neck and we lowered him down. We realized we were missing arms, so we gathered some of the broken sticks we saw when we rolled him over there. We gathered up the sticks from the path. There were notches and scratches in the old wood. We bundled them together and used them as arms. It was crude, but it went well with the rest of his decorations. We stepped back to admire the finished product, and in our exhaustion, exchanged high fives. Braxton was finished. Well, I'll be, Robbie said. Wow, said the twins. After all the hard work, it felt magical. It was short-lived, however, as we finally got a moment to rest. I could hear my mother shouting from away. She sounded angry. I turned to my friends, sad that I had to go. They agreed they would take care of Braxton while I was away, so we could play with him when I got back. We said our goodbyes and I went running along, trying to get to my mother before she got too mad. My mother was furious I was in the woods. She sat me down and explained it was against the apartment rules, and if we were caught in there she would have to pay a fine. She was more in a hurry to go as she cut the lecture short, and I got off easy. She had packed our bags while I was gone, so as soon as I got changed we loaded up the car and hit the road. I slept in the car on the way there, and we made it there in no time. Waking at Grandma's filled me with the Christmas spirit. Her house was a spectacle of lights. She made all kinds of great desserts. I was having fun, but I thought of my friends and Braxton. I was looking forward to getting back to them. The night went on, filled with fun things my grandmother had planned that we do together. The snow started up again, the heaviest we had seen yet. It came down relentlessly through the night. The news talked of a snowstorm, the worst we had seen in a while. The next day, that's when the call started. I remember my mom on the phone while I watched cartoons, talking into her old Motorola with wide hand gestures. She seemed upset, worried. I went back to my cartoons not knowing what was going on. A little later there was another phone call, this one lasting longer than the previous. She started crying saying she didn't know over and over again. The snow was getting worse outside and something about it made me uncomfortable. I don't know if it was just my mom's sudden mood change, but there was something definitely wrong. She hung up the phone and talked to my grandmother in the other room. I couldn't hear what they were saying. Then her phone rang again. And again. There were only a few words I could make out. Things like find and search. It didn't make any sense. Later that night, my mom told me the next day we were going to head home early, once there was a break in the storm. Something about having to help as much as we can. 
It snowed all through the night and most of the next afternoon. Around 6 p.m. the next day, it finally stopped, and once the road was plowed, we made our way back home. As we were halfway home, it started once more. Thick slush and heavy flakes trying to rush us off the road. When we got back, there was a lot of people around the apartments. It had snowed nearly two feet while we were gone. It didn't look anything like it had when I left. They had to answer a lot of questions from police officers inside the apartment and away from the blizzard. Questions about my friends. The last time I had seen them. I told them about the snowman and how we played together. I asked if everything was alright. They told me everything was fine. That they would be back in the morning when the snow cleared up. It was late by the time everything was done. And my mother and I were tired from the drive and the company. Everybody left and we decided to go to bed early. My mother told me I had to sleep in her bed so she would feel better. I agreed, and after some snuggling and some blankets, my mother was snoring and I drifted off. I woke to the sound of tapping. I opened my eyes to find my mother still asleep, snoring softly into the night. I got out of bed to see what it was, not wanting to bother my mom after the long day she had. I went down the dark hall into the living room, and I could see a tall shadow behind the blinds of the sliding door. With a skinny arm, I watched the shadow reach up and tap again. I opened the blinds to see Braxton standing on the patio, and he was moving. He looked at me with his beach rock eyes and held a finger up to his denture mouth. The red stick was a little beat up, and there was a bunch of marks in his face. My guess was from hitting branches. Strange as it was, it felt like a Christmas miracle. With a big smile, I opened the door quietly. Braxton knelt down to see me before he began to speak. Would you like to play with me? I've been waiting, he said. His voice was deeper than I thought, and it was off-putting. But Braxton was a big snowman. I guess that's just how he talked. I can't, I'll get in trouble, I said. Braxton's stone eyes furrowed, his pink scarf blowing in the wind. But I have something to show you. You must see what we made for you. It will be quick, I promise. The others are waiting. It didn't make sense how he talked through the dentures, but they clacked and rasped through the snow. The others are waiting for me? I asked. Yes, we better hurry. That was all I needed. I dressed quickly and quietly, careful not to wake my mom. I would just be there and back. It wouldn't take any time at all. After suiting up, I went outside, and Braxton took my hand. The bundles of sticks had been rearranged into joints and fingers, and they gripped my hand tight. We headed into the woods silently, my boots crunching the deep snow and Braxton scooting on his round base. I looked up at his animated face while we walked, and he looked down at me. It looked like he was trying to smile, but the dentures wouldn't cooperate. I got a better look at the marks on his snowman face. They looked like little handprints, and some scratches. They must have tried to give him eyebrows or something. We walked into the dark woods, Braxton taking me by the hand. How are you alive? I asked. I don't know. Braxton said. Where are you taking me? To the others. They're waiting for us? This late? I asked. We were all going to be in trouble with our parents if they found out. Yes, they're waiting. I looked behind and the building was getting further away. I could barely see the parking lot lights in the distance. The woods looked completely different from before. The large amount of snow blanketing everything. I couldn't see the ground like I did before. Suddenly we stopped and I bumped into Braxton. He scooted aside so I could see. It was a hole. Looking in I could see it was a little opening for something bigger within. Where did this come from? I asked. We dug it. So we could play. 
He put a twig hand on my shoulder and ushered me in. I ducked into the tunnel, straining so I could see. The snow blended into dirt like it was a little cave. There was a flickering light inside, weakly illuminating the passage within. Something felt wrong. When I looked back at Braxton, he just nodded to keep going. I went further towards the light so I could see better around me. When I got closer, I started to make out a dark shape on the floor of the snowy cave. It was close to the light, and when I got closer, I could see it was someone holding a flashlight. Robbie was laying in the snow, the flashlight held in his outstretched hand. Christopher was next to him, huddled in a ball. Their gazes were soft and hazy. As I drew closer, the sinking feeling of cold fire washed over my skin. They were frozen solid. I screamed and stumbled backwards, my hand grazing something hard in the snow to my right. When I saw the pink coat, I knew it was Lucy, her face stone in the dark, snowy cave. I looked from her to the boys in denial, my mind refusing to make sense of what was in front of me. The three of them laid there, their gloves torn to reveal black fingertips. Their skin was pale beneath their clothes, dark, jagged marks across the skin on each of them. Bite marks. I turned, ready to run, but Braxton was blocking my way out. He was hunched over, his twig arms holding him up. His dentured mouth was open unnaturally wide, and something was sliding out of his expanded tunnel of a throat. The frosted mass of dark blue and red slid out of his snowy gullet like a slug and landed on the dirt with a wet plop. Two little figures embracing, frozen together. The twins. I started screaming. Braxton's throat closed, the deep groan echoing in through his warping insides. When his form returned to normal, he looked at me blankly his snowman head cocking to the side in confusion. "'What's wrong?' he asked, scooting a little closer. "'Get away from me! Look what you did!' I shouted, and Braxton flinched. "'I don't understand,' he said, his words plain and sad. "'My friends, what did you do?' I sobbed, my hands shaking. Braxton's eyes shifted for a moment in silence, looking from one body to the next. We wanted to play. We wanted to make a house we could play in. He drew closer, his hands crackling as he flexed his fingers. They got tired and wanted to go home. But they couldn't go. We had to keep digging together. His fake teeth grinded together, the flashlight flickering on his face. The grown-ups started looking, so I had to hide them. If they found them, we couldn't play anymore. So I hid them in the snow so they couldn't see. They'll be up soon, and then we can all play together. He reached a wooden hand out, and I flinched away from it. He recoiled, his stone eyes narrowed on me. The guttural grind of vocals in his throat got deeper, the dentures opening slightly. You want to leave? You don't want to play with me? He asked, his voice getting deeper with every syllable. I shook my head, tears streaming down my face. Don't leave. They'll wake up soon, he said, reaching his hands out. They were inches away. Just as his fingers touched my coat, I broke away and ran. Braxton tried to catch me, but he moved awkwardly in a little hole, swiping wildly with his hands. As I ran out the exit, a beastly roar erupted from the little cavern, echoing through the trees like a lion's roar. I heard him scooting after me, but I kept running. The apartment building was far away, and the snow was coming down hard. The wind whipped through the trees. Behind me, Braxton was working his way out of the cave. The mass of his lower half made him struggle, and I got a head start. I kept my focus on the building, getting closer and closer with each bounding step. Behind me, Braxton called after me, his voice more animalistic than human. I could hear his tree branch arms digging into the snow to pull himself along faster. I ran as hard as I could, blinking away snowflakes in the terrible weather. Behind me, Braxton cursed as one of his arms broke and he stumbled in the snow. I broke through the tree line and started up the hill, 
my boots slipping with each step. I could hear him hissing through the fake teeth, his single arm raking to catch up, his scoots becoming more rapid. I pawed at the ground as I crawled up the hill, running across the yard. Ahead I saw the mound made by the snowplow. I thought of the tunnel we made days ago. I could make it faster there than home. I ran straight forward, the aggravated groans of Braxton echoing as he worked his way up the hill. With each high-kneed step, I ran for Snow Mountain. When I got close enough, I could barely see the opening, the crack of where the snow had almost completely covered it up. I decided it was worth a shot. Behind me, I felt the claws snatching from my snowsuit. I ran and ran, Braxton's cold breath on my neck as we neared the hill. I dove headfirst for the tunnel, painfully jarring my neck as I punched through the open tunnel inside. I squirmed in, Braxton's single hand grabbing my ankle. I kicked at it and broke its fingers, the low growl sounding again. I backed into the tunnel, screaming as Braxton shoved his head in. The dentures clacked as he bit at my feet. They clamped down on my boot and I kicked his face, the big red stick knocking loose and rolling toward me. I grabbed it and held it out in defense swinging the black-capped end to hit him. With a snarl, he bit down on the end, thrashing his head around to tear it from me. He crunched the end and there was a fizzle and pop, and suddenly the stick erupted at the end. Blinding red light exploded at the end of the stick, the searing heat melting Braxton's face in seconds. The heat scared me and I wanted to drop it, but once I saw the damage it did, I held onto it for dear life. Braxton snarled in his terrifying growl, and I held the stick out like it was a magic wand. His features wilted under the heat, but he kept on, chomping at me as he tried to squeeze his way in. I could hear sirens in the distance on the howling wind. The blaring red light gave me energy, and I thrust it into Braxton's eye, knocking one of the stones loose. Like a blowtorch, the searing ember melted the front of his face until the other eye slid away, the hole that once held his nose pooling into a waterfall. As he thrashed, I worked my way backward, holding the red stick out to thwart him. The closer he got, the more I melted. The flame charred the dentures and they shriveled away, his gaping throat choking with rushing water. He tried to scream, but it only came out as gargling, spitting, and splashing as I crawled away. My head hit the end of the tunnel and I pushed, yelling as I tried to break through to the other side. It started to give and Braxton grabbed me my entire foot getting sucked into the melting vortex. I stabbed the stick deep into his face and left it there, the bubbling burn eating through like a hot poker. I yanked my foot free and pushed as hard as I could. I broke through the other end, rolling away in a mess of white. Braxton's cries echoed as he wormed in the tunnel, the dull burn of the stick silencing him slowly. The red and blue flashes of police cars flew into the parking lot, as the snow mountain shook and caved in. Smoke whooshed and water gushed from both ends as it flattened, the heavy snowfall and wind already working to blend it in. As the officers approached, I folded in the parking lot and cried until they brought me to my mother. I don't remember much after that. The police took a team through the storm and found the hole in the snow and the little cave where my friends rested. It was already getting snowed in when they found it like something was trying to bury it. The losses were devastating. They were my last true friends, and I never really moved on from that. I didn't see much of their families after that. They moved far away from me and everything in Cypress Glen. The police combed through the mound that held the monster, and found nothing but a charred scarf and burnt plastic. The storm kept them from properly searching that night, and eventually they called it off. They acted sincere when they questioned me, but I know they never believed my snowman story. Nobody really did. As enough time went on, people stopped talking about the tragedy of Cypress Glen, a terrible night when four children disappeared after getting lost in the snow so close to home. I never really got any answers until I was older. I dug up the police report many years later to find it was mostly incomplete and hushed away. Nobody likes to speak of it. Nobody wants to acknowledge what happened. Hypothermia, they said. Maybe it made them delusional. 
Maybe that's why they were digging. But I know the truth. Even if no one wants to talk about it. Now as I look through the slider, my eyes rest on the freshly packed pile of plowed snow. It sits pushed in the same corner of the parking lot as it did years ago. I'm renting the same apartment my parents had a long time ago just in case it happens again. I own dozens of flares, flare guns, flashlights, the best winter coats and boots money can buy. I hope I'll never need them. I figured if I lived here, I'd be the first to know if it happens again. The neighbors call me a creep, but I check on the kids every time they're playing in the yard. Every winter I watch the snow fall and the kids get excited all over again. None of them knowing the horrors of Braxton the snowman. Sometimes when it snows and the children erect a new winter statue, I watch it through the night. Over and over again till the bastard melts. And with the blowing snow and hissing wind, it stands there, watching me back. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zawal, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mama Cotto, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Larry N50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Bert Turner, Bajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Kerry Harkonnen, Ladonis Bivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batisse, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabula Vore, Raymond Jaggers, That Darn Fox, Raison Detra, Kai Gaming 99, Wendy Burns, The Windigo, Michael Squishy Park, The Gem Star, Vault 77 Citizen, Puppy Dan, Clovis Wolf, Eldridge Elm, Derek Prey, Elder Being, Casey Hawaii, Rob T, Tragic Mermaid, Darren Fishnaller, Cloves and Oya Harris, Roe Underwood, Florida Man Luke, Bethany's Mom, Winter's Kiss, Sam Brooke, The White Stag, Corgi Connection, No Name, Mardakara, and Professor Elm. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos, a Discord channel, and bonus content. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. And if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. It really does help out a lot. And see you again next time at 4pm Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.